I want to say a couple of things real quickly about the table. Uh, people have been asking me. There's uh, several books back there. Um, I was just getting stuff in stock when I sent that, so I, I don't have everything with me. But um, this is a set, and uh, this set is $40 or $4 a piece, and there's 10 uh, Baptist Heroes of the Faith. These will introduce you to people that you've never heard of before. Uh, what, there's a couple real favorites in here. One of them that I won't touch on this week is a man named John Taylor. He was one of those wilderness preachers that swam the frozen creeks and, and wrecked his horses into frozen waters and walked 50 miles in waist-deep snow through the mountains of Virginia. And uh, it's just his, his life is literally more exciting than Daniel Boone's. And uh, so there's, uh, there's 10 of those. And then uh, this is a book we're going to be focusing on the outline, the, the dissertation really uh, and I make some claims in this book, and I document everything. And so if you have any questions about any of the documentation, I want this, the, the, the tree ties to be fully proven this week, and that's what I intend to do uh, for the bulk of this conference is deal with the stuff that's in this book. This is called American Foundations Laid by the Baptists, Why Every American Citizen Owes a Debt of Appreciation to the Baptists. That's not a prideful statement. It's an accurate statement, and it's been far too long that it's not been taught. And so I want to try to bring that out to you this week. So uh, if you would take your Bible with me, we're going to go ahead and start. And um, I have a lot of things racing through my brain, and I want to try to uh, I actually broke down what I have this morning into, into Sunday school and then Sunday morning. So I'm going to ask you to try to pay attention. Um, if you have a pencil, you'd like to take some notes, I would encourage you to do that. I'm pretty sure this is being taped. I'd like to make sure that I get a copy of this as well. Um, this is, uh, I, I keep studying, I keep uh, adding more research, reading more books. And so every time I do a Baptist Heritage Conference, and I've done them for probably about 16, 17 years, I've been doing Baptist Heritage Conferences all over the America and the world. And uh, by the way, some of you, uh, he mentioned some of you folks might be wanting to come on a tour. Um, we will conduct one uh, this fall again in New England, uh, specifically Maine and Boston area. We'll probably do the Boston Freedom Trail again, and that is just, uh, it's an exciting time. Um, it's a glorious time. I've had preachers tell me that's the greatest revival meeting they've ever been to is to be on a tour. And uh, we eat like kings and queens, amen, and, and stay in nice hotels and just enjoy fellowship and, and all the history. And uh, so if you have any questions about that or about our society and what we do as a society, please uh, don't hesitate to come to me and ask me those questions later. Um, let's look in our Bibles. And what I want to just bring out is I want to kind of get you thinking this morning. All of us appreciate our liberty, especially as we see it more and more under attack today. And uh, we never thought that we'd be in the place that we are right now as far as just the sin and, and the wickedness and the fact that people in high places have espoused uh, uh, another brand of government, another philosophy, fascism, communism, and it's, it's being popularized today. And uh, we are in dire straits right now in reference to our liberty. But uh, there's, you know, we have that on one side. And then on the other side, uh, the true history of liberty has really never been taught to the degree that it needs to. And when it was, it was so long ago that nobody really knows about it. And that's really what I want to start with today. I want you to think for a moment in your mind, how did America actually get liberty, specifically religious liberty? I mean, did it just happen? Uh, was it, was it uh, the Puritans that brought it? Uh, you know, where did liberty actually come from? Well, what I want to argue this morning, and I want to look at a verse of Scripture in just a moment. First of all, I want to say this. Liberty was not an invention of man. It's actually a doctrine of God in the Bible. And God's people, the Baptists, have ever defended liberty. I, uh, a few years ago, had the privilege of going to the Waldensian uh, caves in the mountains and where they, where they hid and ran for their lives. And I was able to do documentary videos at the Limat River where Zwingli drowned our Anabaptist forefathers and go to the Newgate Prison, the Smithville Burning Site, and just all over Europe uh, doing documentary videos on persecution. And I want you to understand that there's been one body, one group of people that have ever defended liberty of conscience. And the reason for that is that Baptists believe that uh, we must have free societies. They're most advantageous to the gospel because when we preach the gospel, people have to have the privilege to be able to reject the gospel. And it is only in that type of context that we can know for a certainty that when they've received it, they've received it of their own volition. There's competing theologies, and I won't have time to get into all this. We will deal with Augustine a bit, and I don't want to get back into ancient Baptist heritage, but that same Augustinian dominion theology mindset was transplanted in America, and so those that have been against that and tried to enforce religion upon people, uh, that was here in America. And people don't realize that for almost 200 years, there were state churches in America, and people did not have liberty. So it wasn't like the pilgrims came, put a flag on a rock, and said, hey, we're free now. It did not happen. 
And what most people don't realize is from the early 1600s all the way up to about 1800, there was still a lot of great oppression and really just complete opposition of liberty. So we're going to try to show you how that one man single-handedly, and now there's a long story and there were those that fed into him and, and those that surrounded him and then others that he helped and, and the history's on both ends, but one man single-handedly picked up this, this doctrine of liberty, this doctrine of God, and sailed it across the ocean and made sure that it was so firmly transplanted in America. He was a Baptist, by the way, and he firmly transplanted into America so that we have today a guarantee of religious liberty, and uh, we disavow the idea of an establishment or an established religion. And that was because of one man. Now, I'm going to make some startling statements, and you'll probably raise your eyebrows, but I'll be happy to discuss this with you and give you the documentation and, and show you a, any amount of information you'd like to have on this. This man is as important as George Washington, and I believe more important than Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, George Mason, and Patrick Henry. Say, so how could that possibly be? Well, when you and I rejoice in those men that took this doctrine, uh, that was already brought here by others and taught and fought for and defended and explained and written on and pamphleteered about and petitioned about. When they took that and put it into our founding documents and we thank God for a Jefferson and we thank God for a Madison, how much more should we thank God for the man that actually picked it up and brought it here and made sure that it was here in the new world and being practiced so that people could observe it and see its greatness so that it would make it into our documents. It's a no-brainer. I, I, and again, I, I thank God for these men. I've studied their lives extensively. Washington, Jefferson, Madison, uh, specifically Patrick Henry, who was a great friend of the Baptist, Roger Williams. <clears throat> but these men were not the men that brought liberty here. It was a Baptist by the name of John Clark. And we'll get to him here in just a bit. And I want you to understand something. John Clark is so important that it's not only that he should be taught in conferences like this and we should be acquainted or reacquainted with John Clark, but he should be taught not only in Christian schools all across our country, but John Clark should, I have no idea why that came on him. Uh, that, that's my Jimi Hendrix look or something. I have no idea where that even came from. Uh, this thing has been doing crazy things ever since I plugged it in. But uh, John Clark is, is so uh, vitally important. He should be, children in public school should know about him by like second or third grade for sure. Just like they learn about George Washington, they should learn about this man John Clark. That was once the case, but uh, there's a great attempt to try to hide his, uh, his story. So let's look in our Bibles very quickly to Leviticus chapter 25, verse number 10. The Bible said, And ye shall hallow the 50th year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession. Ye shall return every man unto his family. Taking that biblical definition of liberty where men could be free, the Baptists took that and they believed that and they uh, wanted to implement that uh, into our societies. Let's go ahead and pray together. Uh, I've not been asked to do Bible messages. I love to preach the Bible, but I've been asked to teach Baptist history this week. And so ev almost everything I say is going to be up on the screen. So I'd ask you to pay close attention to what you see. But let's pray together. Father, I ask you, Lord, to help us to understand this doctrine of liberty. Give me grace to be able to say the things that need to be said and to leave out the things that do not need to be said. And God, I pray that you'd give great understanding. Bind the devil away from this place. Help me not to speak too fast. Help me not to just dump information. But God, I pray that I'd be able to make it understandable and I pray that it would get down deep in our hearts. Lord, may we end up having great hearts of appreciation for those that went on before us. But may we also understand that we must take our place in history now, make some Baptist history, birth New Testament churches, and promote liberty. And God, I pray that you'd get all the glory from everything that is said and done today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and jump in. I would change the setting. I'll hopefully, between Sunday school and Sunday morning, I can change whatever setting that was. That was causing me an issue there. Uh, the treatise of my book, American Foundations, goes like this, how America became great through the influence of the Baptists. And what my ultimate goal in this book is to demonstrate how that if you remove the Baptists from the American, uh, the American experiment, as it were, America would completely fall upon its face. In other words, it would be a completely different country today had the Quakers still come, had the Puritans still come? Had the Anglicans still come? Had the Catholics still come? If all of those groups would have came and did, and the Presbyterians and everyone else did what they did, 
and the Baptists were not here, you would be living in a nation that is completely different than what it is today. I attempt to prove that in three different areas. First of all, we'll deal with the spiritual ramifications of the Baptists being in America. We're going to put that aside for now, but you're going to see the greatest revival in America's history. We're going to slow walk through that and demonstrate how that, again, this is what made America the, the nation that using the word as an adjective, we have to be careful. America has been called a Christian nation by those on the outside observing it. What they were saying was there are so many Christians there and the foundation of their law system and their documents and such is Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian principles and culture. And so therefore, this is a Christian nation. They were never saying that you have to be a Christian to be a citizen of America. We know that's wrong. There certainly can be no tests for, uh, of your religion in reference to holding public federal office. They were not saying any of that. Well, and you don't have to go to church to be an American or anything like that. They weren't trying to say we need to enforce uh, the Ten Commandments, but it was used as an adjective. But how did that happen? Well, that, we're going to talk about that spiritual influence of the Baptists. Then we're going to talk about the military influence. Now, most people are probably scratching their heads. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you hear how it was specifically Baptist people, for the most part, that turned the tide of the revolution during a little-known battle that is, again, you'll find, and, and, and this is not just a Baptist preacher embellishing things to uh, try to, you know, purport that Baptists are better than others. By the way, I don't think Baptists are better than other groups, but I will tell you this, I know for certainty that our principles are better than other groups' principles, amen? And our foundation is better than theirs, and our doctrine is better simply because it comes from the Word of God. But we'll look at the military, and we'll prove that out. Again, I, I don't want you to leave here and say, well, that sounds nice, not sure how true it is. I'll try to give you as much documentation as I possibly can. And then the political ramifications of the Baptists are absolutely huge. Today we're going to deal with just the first part of that, Lord willing, tomorrow night and the following night. We'll continue along with that, and it's quite a lengthy story. But let's go ahead and jump in. I want to introduce to you John Clark and America's First Baptist Church. Now, right away, if you took any kind of curriculum uh, in, in a Christian school setting or, or home school, you're going to say, well, no, that was Roger Williams, and you would be completely wrong. Now, I don't want to take a lot of time dispelling the reasons for that, but I will say this. Roger Williams was never a true Baptist a day in his life. He was never scripturally ordained. They baptized themselves, which is no baptism. The group that he started, he abandoned within just a few weeks, was already leery of it, then stated that there was no Baptist church or was no scriptural church on the planet anywhere and that there was no authority of God in any of the churches. In addition to that, uh, I know a man that actually climbed the bell tower, read the bell. The bell de decries and goes against, or rather uh, violates and goes against the whole story. Uh, but in, in addition to all that, if uh, Roger Williams would have started a Baptist church and could have been a Baptist preacher without ordination and baptism and all that, suppose that was legitimate. What exists there today in Providence is not even the church that he started. The so-called church that he started, which was no church, it had no authority to exist, no longer exists. What is there today is a split. Now, why did I give you all that in about a minute and a half? Because some people are going to be sitting here and all you've heard your whole life is Roger Williams, First Baptist Church, and it's just not true at all. In addition to that, if everything were viable and it was all, you know, upstanding and he did it the right way and had authority and had baptism and actually what, it's kind of hard to start a Baptist church if you're not a Baptist. Would you agree with me on that? But suppose it was, guess what, uh, John Clark's church still predates what Roger Williams did. Uh, even if it were legitimate, which it is not, okay? So we're going to get into Roger Williams a little bit, and let me just say this before I go too far. Roger Williams, in another sense, he gets a bad name, okay? I'm not here to say to you, and I don't want you to leave thinking, well, Roger Williams, I thought he was a good guy. Now he's a bad guy. No, he was a very good guy, as good as you can be without being a Baptist. I mean, genuinely, he really was. He was the friend of the Baptists in New England, as later we'll see even in our presentation how that Patrick Henry, a non-Baptist, was a friend and held the hand of the Baptists uh, through their struggle for religious liberty in Virginia. Roger Williams was a great man. He worked with John Clark, was an aide to Clark, was a friend to Clark, and all of that. And uh, I'm not sure whether he was saved or unsaved. He seems to have been a saved man. Uh, certainly him and Clark probably prayed together at times and such. And uh, so sometimes, you know, uh, it's almost like Mary. I, I consider it that way in my head. I make an analogy. Uh, you know, Mary, uh, because they put her on the half shell and, you know, they, they worship her. My mother at 50 years of age got saved at the kitchen table, realized with three aunts that are nuns in our family, she was trusting Mary instead of Jesus to get to heaven. And so we look at that. and It's almost like now Mary has become the redheaded stepchild. Child, 
uh, and we just mistreat her, and it's almost like we make no mention of her. She is to be called blessed and remembered as blessed. She was a godly woman. God did greatly use her. So if I could take those principles and say, now let's go back to Roger Williams for a moment. He was a good guy. And I just want you to understand, he didn't start the First Baptist Church. You have to get that uh, part in your head while still maintaining the idea that Williams was a good man, okay? All right, so let's move on. Now, we really like this guy, John Clark. When I uh, determined to do a Baptist Heroes of the Faith series, uh, the first booklet I knew had to be John Clark. This is where the story of the Baptist really begins in America. Uh, we actually take tours, as I mentioned, and oftentimes I've probably conducted five or six different tours where we went to all of the John sites pertinent to John Clark's life, his burial, his ministry. Uh, we've been to the Providence uh, State House and all of that. And so I just wanted you to understand, I, I think this guy is really, really important. So that's why on the front end of this conference, we need to bring this out. That son right there, that was a few years ago. He's 240 pounds and about six foot tall playing football for Florida Christian right now. But uh, anyway, he's a homeschooler playing football. But he, it just it tickles me when I see that. I, say, I show you this, though, to show you this church still is in existence today on the island of Aquidneck there, which is an island, which is a part of Rhode Island, uh, and so that church is still in existence today. Uh, we, our church, my pastor, uh, started, and we took it upon ourselves. Uh, the last, you'll notice, Monday, every September, we declared it to be John Clark Day. You say, well, what gives you the right to do that? Well, the same authority with which they, you know, make crazy days. I mean, I'm sure they're coming out with one for, like, red-headed aliens, you know, that, you know, are non-binary or something. Uh, it's just crazy. And so, yeah, we, we need to do things like this. Baptists need to step up to the plate. This is our time. This is where God has put us in time and space. And so we need to do things like this. I think it's important. What we do is do a massive social media push uh, through our avenues on our app that we have, the Baptist Heritage Revival Society app, which is Baptist history sites all over America and Europe, uh, which, which gives you GPS coordinates and all of that. We do push through that. We're trying to get educators, teachers, pastors to at least get something downloaded off the internet, buy a booklet, just get something and tell people about this guy to remember who John Clark was. And so our society presented our pastor uh, with this beautiful picture. We'll explain what that picture depicts here a little bit later uh, in memorial just of him, uh, you know, starting John Clark Day. And so he prominently displayed it outside of our Christian school men's room, amen. So anyway, that's where we rate, I guess. But uh, so we praise the Lord for that, though. No, I just wanted the picture of the boys. That joke just kind of developed over that. John Clark in America's <clears throat> First Baptist Church. What about this guy? He was a very pivotal man. God chose to raise up key men to unfold his plan for America. John Clark was one such man. Everything he did was either revolutionary, unheard of, or thought to be impossible. Now, I say that because you have this man of brilliance coming to, to our country uh, before it was a country, the New World, and you're in the infant colonial era. Everything is brand new. Everything has to be built. Everything has to be laid out. Town boundaries need to be set. Governments are literally being developed and thought through and all of that. So when this man of brilliance comes, he rises right to the top and becomes a great leader. We'll look at a lot of his accomplishments. He was first a church builder, then he was a colony builder, and he was also an early framer of our sound form of government. Now, that is the United States government that we have in our Constitution, Bill of Rights, our Declaration, all of that. We'll see how he was the precursor of all of that. There's a picture of the venerable John Clark. Did I bring water up here? Um, I must not have. Could you grab that, brother? Thank you. Appreciate that. John Clark was born in Westhorpe, England, a small farming community. Just to give you an idea of where this is, of course, you know where England is, amen. He was reared in a family of eight children. Five of his siblings would follow him to the New World, and four of them would settle ultimately in Newport, Rhode Island. His education and expertise, Clark was educated in a local village school and at the University of Leyden in Holland. Now, Leyden was a city that was really a, a hotbed for dissent. And we're going to talk about Leyden here in a, li a little bit, and you'll remember Leyden, Holland in just a few moments. But this is where uh, he was educated. There is Holland, obviously, and there is where Leyden is. By the time he reached America, he was a master in theology. It is believed, and we don't know for sure, and actually a couple of years ago I set out to research this in Europe and just came up with more dead ends. Um, I have theories about this that he may have actually submitted to a baptism by the Anabaptists. I cannot verify that, 
Uh, but uh, at any rate, there's no baptismal certificate that we know of that exists for Dr. Clark. But we know that when he came, as all the Baptists did, they believed in staunch order, and it is certain that he was baptized somewhere. It is believed that he was baptized and possibly ordained either in Elder Stilwell's Baptist Church or under the famous John Spilsbury. By the time he reached America, he was a master in theology. As an apologist, he became known as an ardent defender of the Baptist doctrine. When he was brought into court on many occasions, the judge was sorry that he ever asked Mr. Clark to articulate what his actual beliefs were. Because when Clark opened his mouth, not only would oftentimes the judge feel himself being persuaded of his need to be converted out of the state churchism that he was stuck in, but even the jury itself would tend to agree with Clark. The constables would end the charade, shut this man's mouth, and keep him from speaking out because he was speaking truth and they didn't want the truth to get out. Sounds kind of familiar today doesn't it those of us that are speaking truth they're trying to hide that from people but this is the type of man he was he was not uh, he was not afraid to step to the fray and to defend the baptist doctrine by the time he reached america he was also a master in medicine and literally was a trained medical doctor uh, the infant colonies obviously were in desperate need of any doctors at that time, and Clark was a very busy doctor. Upon his death, he was honored by the Newport Medical Society for his contributions to the infant colony. And so he is well known in other circles. And I won't get into this, but uh, actually the first trust in America was founded by John Clark and is still in perpetuity and existence even to this day. So he was a man of means, and he was a man of had his, had his hand in so many different uh, things, if I could put it that way. By the time he reached America, he was also a master in law. This mastery would guide his mind through the maze of ever-changing laws that were enacted to stifle religious freedom. As he tried to do this, he would come to an ultimate conclusion, and that is they're just going to keep changing laws, and they're constantly going to perceive this idea of tolerance as opposed to liberty. We'll get to the creature of tolerance a little bit later. It ought to be abhorred by Baptists because it presupposes two classes of people. But in the end, he realized that the only way to get over these laws and through these laws and defeat these laws was to actually go around these laws, and we'll explain that to you a little bit later. And so as mind was brilliant in this arena as well. By the time he reached America, he was a master in civil government. The governmental documents he authored, along with the framing expertise of Clark, display a brilliance in this arena that outshines the greatest of human minds. Now, there were two key documents that he wrote, and we'll get to those here this morning, either in the Sunday school hour or in the uh, morning preaching hour, but these documents are vitally important, and these are completely unheard of by people today, and I'm talking about Baptists. Now, I'll share this with you. I, I traveled for uh, probably about 18 years going back. I started doing uh, Baptist Heritage Conferences, and then I got to the point where it was like I'd do 10 weeks of Baptist Heritage Conferences in a row. My wife and children were about to pull their hair out, amen, because they heard the same things over and over because people need the basic stories first before you go back. And I've had people have me back a couple of times and go deeper and do state by state or countries or things of that nature. But uh, as we would go through that over and over and over, uh, we would talk about this stuff. And uh, I have gone to churches and I've literally churches of 100, 200, 300, 500. And I would say things like this, has anybody ever heard of, and I'd either say Dr. John Clark and not see one hand go up. Or has anybody heard of, and I would mention one of the two documents or both of the documents he wrote, has anyone ever heard of them? And I've seen 300 people sit there with a stunned look, 400 and 500 people sit there with stunned looks on their faces because they've never even heard of these documents. And it is an absolute travesty. Now, I'm just going to say this again, and I'll try not to say this re repetitively. The devil has a plot. He knows that if he can sever us from our roots, and that's what we're in an identity crisis today, whether you realize this or not in our churches. That's why we see so many brought up in Baptist churches, and all of a sudden they flipped and they've gone to the rock and roll monstrosities that some of us were saved out of rock and roll. We can see right through that, but our children are being deceived today. They don't even know what they are. They've never been taught the price that was paid for the faith they have once delivered to the saints. They didn't know there were 50 millions of the Baptists of the human family called Baptists down through the ages that were had 
their guts torn out and were slaughtered and burned on heaps. They have no idea the price that was paid so that we could have pure churches today. So they treat it as though it's nothing because they don't even know what a Baptist is or where they came from. <clears throat> and it's time that we uh, justify, uh, either or rather rectify, fix that if we possibly can, or you know, try to justify why is it that you won't tell anybody where we came from, amen? I've never heard anybody give a good answer for that. Why do these preachers just completely... Uh, I remember when my former pastor, Pastor Beller, he's in heaven now for about uh, six years now, but uh, Brother Beller wrote the greatest American Baptist history book ever written called America in Crimson Red. I remember when he got, first got real excited about Baptist history, and he started to go talk to some of these so-called big shot preachers, you know, bodies, bucks, and buildings, nickels, and noses. They've got these big monstrosities, and, you know, it's doctor, 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 and all that stuff. And he would go to these men, and he would begin to explain to them uh, why they need to start teaching this. And, I mean, one guy said he got sick, and he had to leave the office, actually. Brother Beller flew all over the country trying to help some of these guys say, hey, we have completely forgotten about who we are we're being overrun by the theology of the catholic reformed right now we have got to start telling our people why we're baptists and here's the information and these men yawned they laughed at it they mocked it they just didn't seem to care i know that's not the case in this church but folks we've got to understand the documents this man wrote we can no longer hide our face from them the pioneering dr clark we will attempt to sum up many of clark's accomplishments under two major headings we could certainly have more. He was a church builder, and then he was also a colony builder. Clark was a tool used to transplant Baptist principles and practices as well as scriptural authority into the new world. Now, I thought this would be entertaining to you because I want to I draw attention to this because right now we're going to leave the John Clark on a trail, a short one, I promise you, because this is information I thought it's good to know because I think sometimes people are going through and they have questions, and I, I get these questions, so I want to try to answer some before we move forward, okay? And so this is a genuine rabbit trail. I don't even try to hide it, amen? That's the, that says something for me, I think, right? But uh, before we examine Clark's arrival in the New World, I want you to consider the pilgrims for a minute. Because I get asked the question, well, weren't the pilgrims here? And the answer is, yeah, the pilgrims are here, so what's your point? I mean, it's like the Quakers being here. The people that sought the inner light were many of them weren't even saved by the grace of God. Uh, and the pilgrims uh, were here, but uh, they were not substantially influential in any positive religious way or even otherwise. Now, let me move on if I may. The pilgrims were those who wanted to separate from Anglicanism and rigid Puritanism. A couple of years ago, I paid a scholar in England to, to tour me in central England to all the sites pertinent to the General Baptists, and I found out just how intertwined the pilgrims were with the General Baptists in the very beginning. Okay? Now, they were originally a part of what many called the Scrooby Congregation, named after Scrooby England. And I hate to burst, I'm just here bursting bubbles all week long, I guess, but the term Scrooby Congregation is not accurate as they were only there for a short time. That is what one historian said he thought about them, and it just kind of stuck. But uh, a pilgrim General Baptist scholar, Adrian Gray, the man I spoke of a few moments ago, who toured me through England and taught me that history on site uh, in his little car going all over the hillside, said that the Gainsborough group would be a more fitting name for the early pilgrims. Gainsborough, England was the hotbed of dissent in that region. John Clark lived not too far from there. William Carey would have been not too far south of there. But a lot of these early pilgrims and early General Baptists were in that region, and they were literally holding uncertified services, going against the Puritan state churches, and uh, they found persecution there, and that is ultimately why they would flee. The early group included John Smith and Thomas Helwes, the early founders of the General Baptist. They were actually a part of that Gainsborough group. Now, I I'd thought that was a possi possibility, but I didn't know it until I actually got there on site, and this was verified to me. Uh, now, Thomas Helwes actually went to the Newgate Prison there in England. Well, the site where the old Newgate Prison was, that's where that John Merton wrote his letter, and it had to be interpreted in milk. And he snuck it out. And the, what he wrote there, pleading for religious liberty to the king, made it into Roger Williams' bloody tenet of persecution. We finally know that was Merton. He was called the anonymous prisoner for many years. But Thomas L. was one of the founders of the General Baptist, went to that jail for preaching the Baptist doctrine, and actually died in that jail uh, there at Newgate. <clears throat> so Smith and Helwes were, they were a part of this early Gainsborough group. 
led by William Brewster and John Robinson, this group of pilgrims, of course, initially fled to Amsterdam in 1608, which the General Baptists and the particulars would also do, going to visit the waterlanders and to try to research uh, immersion, as it were. But uh, to escape religious persecution for holding clandestine services that were not sanctioned by the Church of England. The pilgrims soon moved to Leyden, Holland, and in 1620 sailed to America. One of the neatest things we did was we went to the spot where they actually snuck these people through the countryside, and there ought to be a monument. He was trying to get me to get our society to put something there in England uh, on the site where these people actually got on boats and then floated away and, and ran for their lives. It was a pretty, pretty amazing experience to do that. But yes, they came in 1620. Clark would come about 17 years later. But let me tell you a little bit about them, and I hope this doesn't disappoint you. The pilgrims were not Baptists. They were pedo baptists In fact, they stuck to infant baptism all the way through their theology. They never really moved away from baptizing babies. This, the church, okay, let me tell you about this church, okay? I, I threw this in. I thought it was important because uh, you may actually get a chance to go see this if you come on the fall tour. Not sure how all that's going to work out. But this is called the Old, Old Stone Meeting House in Tiverton, Mass. Now, I'm going to try to show you this in the most unorthodox way. Suppose this is Rhode Island right here. Uh, the island of Aquidnick sticks right down here. Right on the other side in Tiverton, Mass., right on the other side of the island of Aquidneck. So it's kind of in southeastern Massachusetts, is this old stone meeting house. This church was organized by John Cook. The First Baptist Society in Tiverton was among the earliest to be established in America. It's the ninth oldest Baptist congregation in the country. Say, what does this have to do with the Pilgrims or John Clark? Well, let me share this with you. John Cook had come to the Plymouth Colony as a child on the Mayflower and was expelled from the Pilgrim Church in Plymouth in 1654 for the error of Anabaptistry. So in other words, one of the Pilgrims came as a little lad with his daddy on that boat uh, got off and was there at the Pilgrim Church, was convinced of Baptist principles, realized that baptizing infants and sprinkling and pouring and not immersing upon the authority of the church was not correct. And so the, he, they threw him out of the church. Guess where he went? Cook relocated to Dartmouth, joined the Baptist Church in Newport, the one that we're discussing ultimately here. And uh, in, uh, between 1680 and 85, gathered uh, fellow members from Little Compton, Dartmouth, and Tiverton to form a new religious society. This church still holds services to this day as well dates back to the 1680s I believe it's about 1685 or 1686 and I've actually been to this church and toured this church and such and so this is by the way one of the most beautiful places in America I don't know if you've ever driven through Connecticut in the fall but uh, when they moved into the to New England if you've not been to New England they went into those fields and I'm telling you they picked out tens of millions of stones and you know what they did with those stones? They stacked them on their borders. And you can drive for miles and tens or twenties of miles, scores of miles, and it's a two-mile uh, massive uh, wall that they hand-built. You have a space, and you have another two-thirds of a mile, and another mile, and another five miles, and it's just absolutely beautiful. So this region this church is in is dirt, certainly go, worth going to see, but certainly when there's foliage, and the, block, the stone walls just, they, you just hails back, man. Look at the work these people did when they moved into this area. So it's kind of a neat area. And you have heard that the pilgrims died out, and certainly to a large degree, you know the story. You've heard this in school. Some did, while others ultimately assimilated back into the very Puritan state churches that they left to begin with. Uh, the General Baptists never did do that, by the way. But uh, nonetheless, uh, this is the story. So they had no, no recourse, no choice with their poverty and everything that was going on. They ended up getting evaporated back into Puritanism, which was state churchism, okay? So that's just a little bit about the story of the pilgrims. There's much more we could say about that, but I hope you at least are not questioning now, well, what about the pilgrims? Weren't they here first? They were not Baptists. They were baby baptizers, okay? And they went back into the state church, back into Mama. So, all right, John Clark then sails for New England in 1637. He is primed to come and has no idea what he is going to find. They came in hope of religious liberty. Somebody say amen right there. It takes about three hours to put a slide like that together, amen. But anyway, uh, in fact, there's times I've shown it two and even three times to say, I've got to get some miles out of this. I remember the night I put this one together. But anyway, uh, so they come in hope of religious liberty, and that's what these people thought when they got on the boats. And think of this, they left everything behind to never go back, you know, you know many of them. And, uh, but the problem was Clark has his eyes open. Many people found their dreams to be pipe dreams while on these ships. You mean there is no religious liberty? You mean the state churches are already set up in the New World and they're persecuting Quakers and Baptists 
and antinomians and, and a variety of different cultish dissenters. They're, 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 they're really, they really are. And, so, and, and I believe it was uh, Isaac Backus. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was J.R. Graves that wrote uh, the book on trials and sufferings for religious liberty in New England and actually documents some of the conversations that were had on these boats where these people were like, no way, we've just left everything behind and there's not going to be liberty. And I don't know if you and I can imagine that, but that would be devastating. And when they got into Boston, they found out that was absolutely the case. And we're going to tell you the monster that was behind that reason here in just a bit. Clark and his wife landed in Boston in 1637. And Clark has his eyes open and the problem was this guy right here. John Winthrop was the first governor of Massachusetts. There's a lot I could say about John Winthrop, but I don't want you to get the wrong idea when we go through this. Did he persecute Baptist people? Absolutely. Did he try to enforce the Ten Commandments upon your conscience against your will? Absolutely. If you didn't show up for church, could you possibly get your land confiscated? Yes, under his regime, that could all happen. And much more we could say about his dastardly deeds, as it were. Uh, but the issue was this, and I want you to understand this. He meant everything he said. He believed that he was actually doing God's work. He believed that what he was doing was bringing the real true churches to get away from all these, uh, these Anglicans and get away from these uh, Puritans that had been corrupted over there in England and to bring the new, to the new world the proper church and to do it the right way and finally have the perfect kingdom of God on earth. Now let me remind you of something. Catholicism was started in AD 313 when Constantine made Christianity, uh, you know, legal, and that became the state church monster. State and church were married together. Most of us understand that, okay? But then what you had is Anglicanism is the daughter of that, okay? And I've been to the churches in northern England. It's just absolutely amazing thing. Well, you walk to one section, and you can see when it was a Catholic building. The history's there. They've preserved it. And some of these churches are in museum status right now, and you can walk right across the middle aisle over to the other side, and see the history where the Anglicans took this building over. King Henry VIII then said, I capture this in the name of God. And now these are all Anglican churches. And so I've been in some of those churches where they were once Catholic and they're so old that now they're Anglican. And that's basically what Anglicanism was. King Henry VIII could not get the divorce he demanded. Uh, and so he rejected uh, their authority, captured all the Catholic churches under his realm of authority in England. And de facto, they all became the Anglican Church of England. Okay, so then what you had were you had the Puritans. That's one step farther away from Catholicism, still in the lineage and daughters of Catholicism. They wanted to purify the Church of England while still trying to be submissive and respectful to the Church of England in certain areas. Then later on you would have the Congregationalists who would try to even step one further away from that. Presbyterian, Presbyterianism was ultimately produced as well. And I won't get into all of that. But understand, this man was a Puritan of the first rank. He believed he was the very agent of God. We're going to find out what he did here in just a minute if I can get this computer to agree with me. All right, let's try this again. Sometimes this happens and I have no idea other than um, it's Brother Jim's fault. Amen. <laughs> and we'll just, well, hopefully that will, that will help. In 1629, Winthrop took a stand when anti-Puritan King Charles I, a high church Anglican, married to a Catholic, began a crackdown on nonconformist religious thought. He was the first governor of Massachusetts. In October 1629, he was elected governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and he led a group of colonists to the New World in April 1630, founding a number of communities on the shores of Massachusetts Bay and Charles River. Okay? I have no idea why this is giving me so much trouble. Winthrop was convinced that Puritanism was the true church. He further believed that by bringing it to the new world, he was keeping God's true church alive. He thought of his political leadership as a mission from God. This belief stemmed from his covenant replacement theology views. Now, there's a statement that we've heard so often used and misused and misunderstood. Certainly people don't even know where it came from, but it sounds cool. And we've had presidents that have used it. And, uh, but it stems back to him. But Puritanism was the new Israel. Okay. By the way, uh, if you ever study Sam Adams, all you have to do is read one book on Sam Adams. And what you'll find out is, 
it's stunning when you read Sam Adams because he's talked about as such a defender of liberty and he was as far as liberty from England which really wasn't full liberty but still persecuting people under a state church system he was literally what I call John Winthrop reincarnate these guys would say the same things they believed the same things their dedication to state churchism was the same things they believed they couldn't please God without having a state church and so Sam Adams was like John Winthrop's I mean clone it's unbelievable but uh, Puritanism was the new Israel. Because of this, he felt compelled to use force to establish a lawful religious society. He also believed that Massachusetts was God's city on a hill. How many ever heard a president say that? We are, America is the city on a hill. Well, that actually goes back to state churchism, I and mean, it's tying God, uh, the state, and the church together. This, of course, is borrowed from Augustine. There you see a picture of Augustine's City of God. Augustine was the great Catholic theologian that wrote City of God. Uh, City of God's not an easy read. Now, I'll never forget the first time I closed the last page. I was so proud of myself, and I sat back and pondered and said, I don't see really what's wrong with it, honestly. I say, really? You read City of God and came to that conclusion? I don't know if I'm just a slow, slow individual. I read it the second time and said, you're kidding me. That is what he is saying? I couldn't conceive that anybody would actually be saying what Augustine actually taught and purported in his book that the kingdom of God is actually now and the devil is bound. I was just discussing this with a man who's in Homestead who happens to be a pastor of a church. I said, the devil is bound now. You actually believe that and you're, you're all millennial and, and all of that and you're a praetorist. Everything that happened in Revelation, it, it happened in 70 AD, it's not to come. How do you justify that? I mean, how do, you, how do you make that work with the Bible statements like the devil's a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, that he's taking people captive at his will, that he's a god of this world blinding people's minds. How do you justify that? Uh, you know, with this idea that the devil is bound and the kingdom is now but this is exactly what he believed that this was the kingdom of God brought to the new world and therefore he would kill you if you went against what he thought God was teaching which was the Ten Commandments it was Old Testament law versus New Testament liberty of conscience okay and so this is what John Winthrop was we often hear the religious right moral majority Catholic reformed in America refer to our country as the shining city on a hill this is often not by mistake there are post millennialists who think they're bringing in the kingdom this is not all millennialism this is reformed Catholic reformed theology what the Catholic reform believe for the most part and there's variations in this man they've got uh, covenant uh, Covenant premillennialism now and, and progressive dispensationalism. And there's always uh, these ebbs and flows of uh, theology and such. But, but those that truly believe uh, this postmillennialism believe they're, believe they're bringing in the kingdom and they absolutely do want a state church. Now, I'm going to make a statement, and you'll probably think I'm a liberal for about five seconds here, okay? I understand why the educated leftist liberals hate the religious right. I get it. Really? Aren't we in the religious right? Well, I'm not. No. I'm a Baptist constitutional republic guy, amen? And I'm not on the religious right. And what they know is the snake in the woodpile is there are a lot of people in the moral majority, religious right, Presbyterianism, their theology dictates it. If they could have a state church right now, they would. And you may hate me for saying this, but this idea of fighting to put up a Ten Commandments monument on your front yard, big deal I have with that is the people that are doing it will not walk across their yard in front of their house and, and tell their neighbor that they're going to hell and that Jesus loves them and they need to be saved by the grace of God. They're fighting and dying to bring the kingdom in through social reform, enforcement of the Ten Commandments, putting the Bible back in school, setting up monuments to God, all of these public displays because that's all part of the kingdom. And I'm not against any of those. I'm against public education, I guess. But so, so a lot of that stuff just null and void to me anyway. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But I know this. Every time, and, and so we're going to get into separation of church and state later. I don't want to get into that right now. I certainly don't believe that separation of church and state means we should erase God from society. That we should never take our Baptist principles at the table of civil government. I certainly don't believe that. I'm all for all of that. But you've got to understand there's a group out there and they've got a thought in their mind. And this is their theology they want America to go back to being a state church again. And that's why some of the educated lefties actually know what's going on. Now, they do lump us all in together. We don't believe that, what, those, uh, what the reform believe, but they lump us all together. I hope I'm not confusing you. Now, how do I know this? Well, this is interesting. Alexis Mistan, who was a, a Waldensian pastor, um, state churchism is sadly alive and well today. He said this. In, in fact, in his uh, Waldensian uh, 
two-volume set, which is absolutely tremendous. Um, you get about page 87 or something like that, and, and he's giving a history of the Waldenses and their slaughters and their faith, and, and he almost breaks into this prophecy, and it's like, wait a minute, this is Mustan actually so embroiled in all of this that he's proclaiming a judgment upon Rome. And he said this, and it rings so true today. He said, O oh, Rome, and her daughters, by the way, hypocrite that thou art, shedding crocodile tears, because thou canst not now in thy decrepitude glut thyself with human flesh as in time past. What need have we in contending against thee to enter into the lists of controversy? Now, you and I know that Rome and Rome's daughters, because of the situation of the nations, the militaries, and all of the governments, that they're not able to persecute right now. They're not able to set up state churches and slaughter people like they used to. But if they could, they would. And we have to understand that. Well, John Winthrop could, and he did. And that is exactly what took place for 200 years in this country. I've got five minutes. We're, we're doing well. Amen? So Clark comes, and he has his eyes open. He doesn't realize what he's getting himself into. He learns that Roger Williams was already previously banished about a year earlier before Clark ever arrived. Now, let me just say a word about uh, banishment. Banishment to the, the American wilderness was like a death sentence. Can you imagine? You can no longer be here in civil society. And anyone that aids you, and anyone that gives you weapons, and anyone that gives you foods, they're excommunicated from the church. They themselves will find themselves banished. So it was a system of everybody has to be in lockstep, following the Ten Commandments, listening to Mr. Winthrop and his preachers, bringing our uh, infants to compulsory infant baptism, paying the parish state church tax, being there every service. We have to do this, and we can't even affiliate with those that have been ostracized from the churches. So they would take away your weapons, which took away your ability to defend yourself, took away your ability to kill all of your food, had to be killed, basically, if you're in the wilderness. So this was, in essence, a death sentence, unless you're a very wise man, as Roger Williams was, okay? And there were enough dissenters that they would find each other, they would hear of each other, and they would aid each other when they were banished. If they were not put to death, we'll find out that the Puritans actually put people to death for their so-called false faith right here in America as well. I, I've talked about Roger Williams. I'm, I wanted to remind myself that, amen? All right, the magistrate's law made it illegal to be affiliated with non-approved churches, Clark had his weapons confiscated for being a Baptist. Gets off the boat, finds out you're in a state church, sir. Give me your weapons. We have heard that you are a Baptist, and we cannot have you people. Do You're going to have to attend the church. This is your parish. This is what you must do. And so they took his weapon away from him. The Calvinist theocracy. We touched on this a bit. This theological error is what our Baptist forebears faced in Puritan New England when they first arrived. The Baptists, however, believed in a proper separation of church and state, which, by the way, was an answer to the fact that the state churches were encroaching upon the faith and the conscience of Baptist people. That's what original separation of church and state was for. It was saying that the, the state, which has no jurisdiction whatsoever, cannot put its ever encroaching ungodly arm into a jurisdiction, the embassy of Jesus Christ, where it has no jurisdiction whatsoever, okay? And that's what's really, and it wasn't called separation of church and state, but this is certainly what, how it was, why it was even put together in the beginning. A belief that the church should be sovereign and autonomous was described by the statement a garden enclosed. Now, this is what the Baptist taught. And this is a statement, actually, by Roger Williams. He said that the church was a garden enclosed and that the wilderness outside the garden is the state. He said, or rather, Baptists have always believed in this separation. The Roman Catholic institution violated this belief and murdered millions of Baptists because of their stand for this separation. What you basically had was Baptist principles of liberty versus the state church machine. John Clark and Roger Williams believed the state should not enforce the first table of the law. Now, what do I mean by that? They had the Ten Commandments broken down into two tables, and they said there are some commandments that fall under legitimate jurisdiction of governments, and others must be left to men and to their consciences. Note, for example, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That has to do with man and his relationship with God. And if man goes into his closet or stays in his home or even publicly worships idols, the state should not come in and do this and this and throw him in jail and kill him or hang him to death or anything like that. Thou shalt not make into thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Now, while we agree with these things to be correct, obviously, whether we agree or not, they're God's word in principle, 
when you go about to enforce these, you are trying to shove the gospel, not even the gospel, but a legal system of, of religion down somebody's throat and actually keeping them from accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. It is not the gospel at all, okay? And if you did not do this, so if you're a Baptist, okay, and you didn't follow uh, this, these commands. And by the way, what this meant basically was this. You have to follow everything that the Anglican, which would be set up in other colonies, or the daughter of Anglicanism, the Puritan church, says, otherwise you are going to pay a serious price, okay? John Clark and Roger Williams believe the state should only enforce the second table of the law. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. See, this is the old, the old idea where if you swing your fist, you have full liberty until it connects with my face. And this is what they believed, okay? This is where the jurisdiction now falls under uh, the state, and the state should certainly enforce these. And so it was the first table versus the second table, okay? And uh, we're going to start here when we begin. We're at 1045, and let me tell you about some of the people that were persecuted for their faith.